So I welcome you all to a grand round today. Today we have a topic that I think is incredibly timely in the world of uh, antimicrobial stewardship, trying to be sure we're using the narrowest drug for the right bug, um, trying to navigate people's allergies and so on. Um, there has been an exploding experience with really thinking about the, um, the immense amount of penicillin allergies that are reported on charts that may or may not have any basis in reality. And so um, with that in mind, we have actually a crack team who's really been addressing this at our healthcare systems. And so have agreed to do a triumvirate of a presentation um, and I'm thrilled. Um, so I want to um, introduce and I'll introduce all of the speakers and I'm gonna do it uh, very briefly and I'll let them then trade off. So uh, representing today will be uh, Xanthia Wiley, who's an assistant professor of medicine in infectious disease. Um, uh, Marin Curavilla, who's an assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology, and Mary Beth Sexton, who is assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease as well. And they are going to tell you about the problem and about the many steps we're taking to address it here at Emory Healthcare. So thank you guys very much. Thank you for that introduction. And um, so Marin, um, Mary Beth, and myself are going to take you through the ABCs of penicillin allergy evaluation. And we have no disclosures. So what we hope that you will take from this talk is, number one, to describe the um, types of drug hypersensitivity reactions, and to know that the vast majority of patients with documented penicillin allergies actually are not allergic, to help you risk stratify patients into four different categories those who can receive penicillin with no further workup, those who can receive a cephalosporin with no further workup, those who, the big question is who needs an oral penicillin challenge or a penicillin skin test? And last but not least is who should undergo desensitization? And when should you call us? When should you all um, consult allergy or immunology or both? So antimicrobial stewardship is near and dear to my heart. I'm sure that everyone in this room thinks that they are fabulous antimicrobial stewards. So the definition of stewardship is, are any strategies and interventions aimed towards improving the appropriate prescribing of antibiotics in all healthcare settings? So do we have the appropriate drug? Do we have the appropriate dose, the appropriate duration? And also in penicillin allergy evaluation, it's important to be able to risk stratify that patient adequately to give them the appropriate appropriate um, antibiotics, because we all need to handle antibiotics with care. So how are we doing um, in the hospital? So six years ago um, in MMWR, they released a report on um, vital signs improving antibiotic use among hospitalized patients. So um, they had, there were 323 hospitals. They looked at every patient that was discharged from that hospital for whatever reason. This was the year of 2010. So whether you were in the hospital for a stroke, CHF, DVT, all comers. And what they looked at was what were the frequency of um, prescribing certain categories of antibiotics. So let's take a look. So what you see here on the um, x-axis is the percentage of these patients who were discharged who received antibiotics and on the y-axis are our different categories of antibiotics so what you'll see is the most commonly prescribed were first and second generation cephalosporins most of this were perioperative antibiotics but take a look at those with a little um, um, cross mark so very broad spectrum antibiotics in over 30% of these discharge patients. So we're looking at beta lactam, beta lactamase inhibitor, so our Piptazo, fluoroquinolones, and our third and fourth generation cephalosporin. But what I found most striking is 56% of patients who were hospitalized for whatever reason receive an antibiotic at some point during their hospital stay. So, you know, you may think, oh, not, not my patients, but at some point, whether they were in the ER or IR or they received surgery, one in two patients um, receive an antibiotic for at least one day during their hospital stay. So we're prescribing lots of antibiotics, okay? And when we prescribe antibiotics, we have to kind of think about what is this doing to our patients? So this was published in JAMA in 2017, looking at the association of adverse effects, events with antibiotics in hospitalized patients. So their question that they asked was, what is the likelihood of developing an antibiotic-associated adverse drug event 
in a patient who's receiving um, antibiotics. So before we get to that answer, let's kind of talk about some of the adverse um, events. I think most people, when we think about you know, receiving antibiotics, remember that we're worried about C. diff or new multi-drug resistant antibiotics. So those are the two answers that the vast majority of people give. But I want us to start kind of broadening this a little bit and remembering that our antibiotics can cause altered mental status. You may, you may think about cefepime doing this, cardiac, quinolones with prolonged QTC, your patient with congestive heart failure receiving IV penicillins resulting in volume overload, GI or hepatobiliary, so increased LFTs, um, drug-induced hepatitis, loose stools that's not due to, to C. diff, renal, acute renal failure in your patients with, um, who are on vancomycin or acute interstitial nephritis on beta-lactams. Dermatologic, Marin is gonna go through some of the dermatologic manifestations musculoskeletal or quinolone patients who are um, having tendinopathies or tendon abnormalities. And last but not least, hematologic um, dysfunction. So essentially, all antibiotics can affect all of these cell lines. So when we think about adverse events with antibiotics, let's think about everything here, not just C. diff and multidrug resistant infections. So what was, were their overall findings? 20%. 20% of patients who receive an antibiotic um, will have at least one of these adverse drug effects. So over 50% of our patients are receiving antibiotics, 20% are developing these adverse drug effects. So it's really important for us to you know, be careful about how we're prescribing. And the most important reason is Mrs. Jones and every other patient that we take care of on a, on a daily basis. So let's um, take Mrs. Jones through her emergency room visit. So she's a delightful 75 year old lady with end stage renal disease and diabetes. And she came in with um, cough and she has grain of sputum production. She's kind of hacking up in the, in the ED. She avoids the hospital at all costs has not been in the hospital for at least a year. She has not received any IV antibiotics. You checked with her dialysis doctor, not even during um, dialysis, and we have no prior culture data to go on. But what she tells you is, doc, I'm allergic to penicillin. And all she knows is that she had hives as a child. Um, her mommy is not available to give us any further history. Okay, so this is all we have to go by. And on exam, she's febrile, she's tachycardic, She's hypoxic, she's coughing, 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 and you hear agophony in the right lower lobe. So um, your ED colleagues call you and they already have some labs cooking for you. And I'll just point out that her white count is 16 with 90% PMNs. So what you're thinking to yourself, I think Mrs. Jones has pneumonia, but Mrs. Jones has hives to penicillin. Let's get an EKG because maybe I can give her an alternative um, antibiotic. Um, let's be careful there because her QTC is 520. So we get an x-ray and I think even without these four red arrows, we can all see this, this infiltrate. She, so she has a pretty dense right-sided infiltrate. So um, what we're going to kind of, Marin, Marin and Mary Beth are going to take us through, how are we going to handle Mrs. Jones with this penicillin allergy and how should we keep, treat her cap? And I'm very glad that you all know that she has community acquired pneumonia and that HCAP doesn't exist anymore and that she doesn't qualify for um, hospital acquired um, pneumonia. So um, there's a lovely article that was um, just published in JAMA earlier this year on evaluation and management of penicillin allergy. And I would highly recommend this to, to all of you. And essentially what they say is 10% of hospitalized patients have a penicillin allergy. And it's even higher in our hospitalized patients and in our older patients. So we have a lot of patients who are receiving a lot of antibiotics and a lot of them have allergies. So what Marin is going to take us through is that clinically significant IgE mediated or T cell mediated penicillin hypersensitivity is low. So I will pass the torch to Marin. So I'm going to be talking about the different manifestations of a penicillin allergy, as well as our current diagnostic approach to a penicillin allergy label. So as Anthea said, 10% or an estimated 32 million patients in the United States are affected with this diagnosis of a penicillin allergy label. However, as you can see, the incidence of a new onset self-reported penicillin allergy label 
has progressively decreased through the years. In a study out of um, 1966, patients would self-report a new incidence of penicillin allergy at a rate of 7.8%. And this in contrast with a more recent study out of Kaiser published about 10 years ago, where less than 1% of all comers out of, I think a total of about half a million patients reported new onset penicillin allergies. However, penicillin still remains the leading cause of drug-induced anaphylaxis, and this has been reproduced in several large cohorts. This risk of anaphylaxis is exceedingly low with oral administration of penicillin and is estimated to be about 0.005%. And in a review of more than 100 million treatment courses with oral penicillins in the UK between 1972 and 2007, there was a single case of fatal anaphylaxis. Before we talk about the different manifestations of penicillin allergy, I'm just gonna talk briefly about what actually constitutes a drug allergy. As Xanthi alluded to, there are various different adverse reactions that can occur with different antibiotics, which are broadly categorized as type A or type B reactions. The type A reactions are the ones that are predictable, dose dependent, and can be related to pharmacologic side effects, drug overdose, drug interactions, as opposed to type B reactions, which are unpredictable and idiosyncratic. These include drug intolerances, as well as drug allergies, and what was previously known as pseudoallergy, and is now thought to represent a non-immunologic activation of allergic cells or mast cells. Broadly, we still categorize antibiotic-induced allergic reactions based on the original Gell and Coombs classification of hypersensitivity reactions. And I'm gonna talk about each one of these in the context of a possible penicillin allergy. Type one being your prototype IgE-mediated immediate onset reaction, the classic example of which is penicillin-induced anaphylaxis. Type two is antibody-mediated, typically mediated by IgG antibodies, and would present as, for instance, penicillin-induced hemolytic anemias. Type three is immune complex-mediated, for example, serum sickness. And finally, type four, which is what I usually see in practice, and a delayed onset cell-mediated, most likely T-cell-mediated, maculopapular exanthem, although it may represent more severe cutaneous adverse reactions. Um, this is a graphic that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few months ago on penicillin allergy and represents the pathogenesis of penicillin allergic reactions. As you can see in column A, penicillins, as well as all other beta-lactams, share this common core beta-lactam ring. However, in the case of penicillins, this beta-lactam ring is highly unstable and tends to sort of break down spontaneously and binds to various different residues in host serum proteins through a process called haptination to form both major as well as minor allergenic determinants. Um, in column B, the top box represents the formation of the major allergenic determinant, what is referred to as penicillol polylysine, and haptination from binding of this broken down core beta-lactam ring to carboxyl and thiol groups creates different minor allergenic determinants, including penicillinate, penicillinate, and penicillin itself can act as a minor determinant. Mary Beth's gonna talk further on cross-reactivity rates between penicillins and cephalosporins, but I just wanted to mention really quick that all the other beta-lactams do not have a core beta-lactam ring that's prone to spontaneously break down. They are a lot more stable. And for cephalosporins in particular, both immediate as well as non-immediate reactions are thought to derive from the R1 group side chain and to a lesser degree from the R2 group side chain. So other than those circumstances in which penicillins have a similar or in some cases identical R1 side chain to cephalosporins, the risk of cross-reactivity is overall extremely low. Moving on to type one or immediate reactions caused by penicillin. And as I said, the prototype reaction is IgE mediated in which a drug antigen <clears throat> would bind to its specific IgE and complex on the surface of allergic cells, that is mast cells and basophils and consequently results in the release of various mediators of which histamine is the most well known. While type one reactions are classically considered to be IgE mediated, there are several other underlying mechanisms that can cause immediate onset drug allergy. And these include drug-specific IgG, 
complement activation, and what is previously known as pseudoallergy or direct non-immunologic activation of mast cells and basophils. When mediator release affects a single system and say the patient would present with hives and angioedema, that doesn't count as anaphylaxis. We describe anaphylaxis if patients have symptoms that are affecting two or more organ systems. So for instance, if they have hives and angioedema plus respiratory symptoms or respiratory symptoms plus GI symptoms, that's what meets criteria for anaphylaxis. I'm gonna skip over type two and type three since they're not very seen very frequently. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about delayed or non-immediate reactions, which are thought to be T cell mediated. And these occur more than an hour after exposure. And in most cases happen several days into the treatment course or sometimes even weeks into the treatment course. The most common clinical finding is this delayed onset, non-specific, benign, uh, T cell dependent maculopapular exanthem or just this rash that tends to resolve spontaneously. Um, however, in although far more less frequent, life-threatening severe cutaneous adverse reactions or scars have also been reported. Overall, IgE-mediated reactions can be diagnosed to a certain extent by skin testing, although this also has its drawbacks as we will see. In general, T-cell-mediated reactions are more challenging to diagnose because skin testing is not useful and also we still don't completely understand the mechanism behind these T-cell-mediated reactions. Most drug allergic reactions tend to affect the skin. And these are some examples of what you would expect to see with IgE as well as T cell mediated reactions. The first picture is that of your classic urticarial wheels that can occur upon immediate exposure to medication. And these are IgE mediated. They develop within minutes and sometimes hours. They're raised, extremely itchy, and each individual lesion lasts for less than 24 hours and they fade without any scarring. The second picture is that of a benign T-cell mediated maculopapular exanthem. And this is less pruritic. Each lesion lasts for more than 24 hours, although the lesions generally tend to resolve on their own over days to weeks and heal with a fine desquamation. And the last picture is that of a patient with Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is one of the many severe cutaneous adverse reactions. These reactions usually have a latency period of days and sometimes as in dress syndrome, even weeks. They present with skin, skin blistering, sometimes skin desquamation. Um, SGS is notorious for affecting the mucosal surfaces. Um, dress syndrome tends to affect internal organs. Often these reactions require hospitalizations and tend to have a higher mortality rate that can range anywhere from 10% for Stevens-Johnson's and up to 90% for patients with toxic epidermal necrolysis. However, when we see a penicillin allergy label in the patient's medical record, it is highly likely to represent none of the previous reactions that we just talked about. Um, and in fact, in a study of more than 500 patients with this penicillin allergy label who were investigated at Kaiser, it was found that patients with a history consistent with an acute onset benign cutaneous reaction, that is drug-induced immediate onset urticaria, accounted for only two to 3% of all penicillin allergy labels. Similarly, patients with a clinical history consistent with anaphylaxis accounted for less than 0.1% of all of these labels, and delayed onset benign cutaneous reactions, or exanthems, accounted for about 1% to 2% of reactions. <clears throat> a clinical history suggestive of a severe cutaneous adverse reaction was actually found in much less than 0.1% of all penicillin allergy labels. And in fact, 95% of these allergies were not immunologically mediated at all, um, but rather were a reflection of a pharmacological reaction, a side effect, a drug intolerance, yeast infection, or some other benign reaction. The epidemiology of penicillin allergy itself has changed significantly throughout the years, as is evidenced from um, this paper that was published back in 1981 that highlights the rates of positive penicillin skin testing back in the 1970s. And you can see a shift in the rates of positive testing even in the, from the first half of the decade and the second half of the decade, where you have rates of 72 and 49.7% respectively, overall yielding an average for 63% positive penicillin skin tests for the decade. However, in a study that was um, published about a decade ago, uh, again at Kaiser, you can see how the rates of positive penicillin skin testing again have prog progressively continued to decrease through the years from 15% in 1995 down to 3% in 2018 
in 2007, and in more recent large cohorts, the rates of positive penicillin skin testing are even lower. And the reason for this discrepancy between allergy labels and true sensitization or true reactivity are actually multifold. The most common being that a lot of times patients end up with this penicillin allergy label in childhood, and various miscellaneous childhood rashes are misattributed to penicillin. In one study, it was shown that 75% of all children with allergy labels are diagnosed before three years of age. And children tend to break out for all kinds of different reasons. And one of the most common reasons is an intercurrent viral infection for which they often get placed on penicillin, develop a rash, and then they end up with a penicillin allergy label. And we've known this for a long time, but it was actually validated in a prospective study of children out of Switzerland uh, who develop rashes during beta-lactam therapy. And once they develop these rashes, serologies as well as PCR were sent off for common respiratory viruses. 88 of these children were followed up two months later. They all underwent skin test and oral challenge. And interestingly, more than 93% of them passed a challenge with oral amoxicillin. In the remaining six patients, EBV was confirmed, which is known to interact directly with amoxicillin to trigger a macular papular exanthem. More than 50% of patients in the study had a positive viral PCR, supporting the role of viruses in causing what are misattributed to penicillin. Another reason for this discrepancy between penicillin allergy labels and true reactivity is the natural history itself of penicillin allergy that both IgE-mediated as well as non-IgE-mediated reactions. And this is something we've also known for a long time based on a retrospective study that was published about four decades ago in which 80% of patients with positive penicillin skin tests lost their sensitization 10 years after testing and was recently confirmed by a prospective study that followed 31 patients with positive penicillin skin tests. And at one year, 81% of patients continue to have positive tests. But by five years, um, this represents patients who tested positive for penicillin polylysine, which is the major determinant. So 50% of them continue to have positive skin tests and all of them had lost sensitization to the minor determinants. And we know this holds true for most patients, even with the non-IgE-mediated de benign delayed cutaneous eruptions. What we still don't know is the natural history of severe cutaneous adverse reactions. And I think it's because in those cases, the risks of a recurrent reaction significantly outweigh the benefits of possible re-administration. So we generally hold off on any further drug allergy workup in this population. So this is the first step that we perform when facing a penicillin allergy label, which is taking a drug allergy history. And there's an example of a penicillin allergy history toolkit that was published out of Rochester, New York. And as you can see, it's pretty self-explanatory. It doesn't really need any formal training to take this penicillin allergy history. And a lot of times patients can be delabeled just on the basis of a very superficial uh, few questions. This particular toolkit categorizes patients into those with intolerances who do not need any further workup and can just go ahead and delabel them safely. Patients who are low risk in whom a direct oral challenge with amoxicillin may be considered. Patients who are moderate to high risk with a history consistent with IgE mediated anaphylactic reactions um, who would be candidates for a penicillin skin test followed by a drug challenge. And finally, uh, patients who are high risk in whom further penicillin allergy workup is contraindicated due to the potential for severe cutaneous adverse reactions. The most important details to take um, when asking for a penicillin allergy history is the date of the index reaction, the drug that was used, the dose administered, and the route of administration. In addition to symptoms associated with the reaction, if the reaction was recent enough, I usually also ask whether there was any intercurrent infection, especially in the case of children. Um, also ask for details of treatment administered. We would expect that the benign delayed cutaneous reactions would resolve spontaneously without any unscheduled medical attentions, whereas the severe cutaneous ones would possibly require hospitalization. And also for exposures to penicillin since the index reaction, there are times we encounter patients who have this label of penicillin allergy, but will tell you that they received amoxicillin several times following the index reaction without any, any issues. Next, we used to perform a lot of penicillin skin testing a few years ago before it was understood that most patients with this penicillin allergy label do not necessarily require the step in the workup. 
Currently, we reserve penicillin allergy to skin testing only for patients who are labeled as high risk. That is patients who have a recent history, especially in the past year, that's compatible with an IgE-mediated anaphylactic reaction, and where the clinical history really ties in with drug-induced anaphylaxis. Um, it's performed with two different reagents. We use prepen, which is the major allergenic determinant, or penicillog polylysine, and this is currently FDA available for the past 10 years and marketed as prepen, and we also use PENG, which is one of the minor determinants, in Europe, for whatever reason, patients tend to be a lot more sensitized to the minor determinants, and they actually use a minor determinant mixture as one of the reagents, which is not available here. Uh, we apply both of these reagents in duplicate uh, using intradermal testing, as well as a negative control, and then we read the results at the end of 15 minutes. According to the package insert, a change in the wheel size of five millimeters from baseline is representative of a true um, allergic reaction with potential for IgE-mediated reactions on repeated exposure to penicillin. Overall, the penicillin skin test has pretty good predictive value in excluding an IgE-mediated penicillin allergy at a rate of close to 99%, but all penicillin skin tests require a follow-up challenge to definitively sort of take this allergy off the table. And more recently, the question has arose whether skin testing is required at all, and this is based on several different studies as well as um, theories, first of all, that skin testing is subjective and carries the inherent risk of false positive results. And in a study of 25 adults that was just published a couple of years ago, with positive penicillin skin tests, only nine of them, or 36%, reacted on subsequent oral challenge. Similarly, in another recent study of more than 800 children, Oral challenge had extremely high rates of specificity, negative and positive predictive values, whereas sensitivity for a, of a skin test for the diagnosis of amoxicillin allergy, especially in children where the reaction is most often a delayed exanthem, likely viral, is less than 10%. So the approach has shifted now to performing direct oral challenges or direct drug provocation tests. And Currently, we perform direct oral challenges pretty routinely in patients who are considered to be low risk. We use single dose challenges in our clinic and in the hospital because even while other healthcare systems have employed two-step challenges, starting off with one-tenth of the final dose and then the remainder of the final dose after an interval of about 30 to 60 minutes, this has never really been shown to improve safety. And so we also opt for a single day as opposed to a multi-day challenge because this has high diagnostic accuracy and the, runs the least risk of promoting antibiotic resistance. There are several questions that remain with respect to performing these direct oral amoxicillin challenges for patients with penicillin allergy labels, especially given that this is a relatively new approach and has not been standardized between institutions. First of all, what constitutes low risk? The definition varies from place to place. What is the optimal oral challenge protocol? And where does penicillin skin testing fit into all of this? And more recently, just a couple of months ago, uh, out of Rochester, New York, they published the first randomized controlled trial that directly compared skin testing and drug provocation testing. And they selected about 360 subjects and looked for those that were considered low risk. Low risk being defined in the pediatric population as with a history of a benign cutaneous only reaction more than one year ago, and a similar reaction in adults more than 10 years ago. Out of the 360 odd subjects, 159 met criteria for being low, low risk, and were randomized to either a skin test and subsequent oral challenge versus a direct oral challenge alone. Out of the 80 patients who were randomized to undergoing a skin test, 10 of them ended up being read as positive. But as I said before, what the package insert for prepen states is that a change in wheel size of at least five millimeters is necessary to deem somebody as having a positive skin test, whereas this study used a, a threshold of three millimeters of change to label patients as being penicillin allergic. And so this low level sensitization may have been false positive, but these patients did not undergo a subsequent oral challenge. The remaining 79 patients who were randomized to a direct oral challenge um, had a two-step challenge, and there were three minor reactions, and a couple of patients, they were subjective. One patient had some minor hives. The key trend in this trial was that there was a trend towards fewer patients who were delabeled in the skin test group as opposed to those who underwent a direct oral challenge. 
So this is the recommendations that we currently follow at Emory. And we define low risk based on the protocol out of Kaiser, where they have actually investigated more penicillin allergy labels than anybody else in the country. We use low risk criteria based on the presence of any benign rash that developed over a year ago, any other benign somatic symptoms, and if patients have a remote unknown history of a reaction that possibly happened in childhood. And as I said, we perform a single dose challenge with 500 milligrams followed by an hour of observation to rule out any significant IgE mediated hypersensitivity. And then we request that the patient uh, sort of monitor for any delayed onset rashes for at least two to five days following discharge to rule out any clinically significant T cell mediated reactions. Another question that has come up is whether the single dose of amoxicillin is sufficient to exclude delayed reactions since there is usually a latency period for several days before the onset of a T cell mediated eruption. And we are still not 100% sure whether you require that cumulative dose of penicillin to really trigger these activated T cells. However, based on several different studies, a couple of which I've highlighted here, these prolonged drug provocations appear to be of limited utility in patients with penicillin allergy. Um, as evidenced by a cohort of 132 patients who underwent this negative single dose challenge with amoxicillin, and then they had a washout period for about a week, uh, and then had a prolonged five day challenge. And 116 <coughs> oral challenges in this population led to only one mild cutaneous reaction. Similarly, in a UK study of more than 8,000 beta lactam drug provocations, only 1.8% of non-immediate reactions were diagnosed after prolonged oral provocation testing. Yet another question that has arisen with this whole challenge of delabeling penicillin allergies is that of possible resensitization when these delabeled patients are challenged with future courses of antibiotics. And previous large cohorts have noticed this new reaction after delabeling of about 3% with future antibiotic use, although this again appears to be declining in recent years. Overall, there is a very low risk of reacquiring allergy following oral courses of penicillin. And recently in a cohort of 32 inpatients out of Parkland, Texas, who received a total of 111 parenteral courses of penicillins after delabeling, there were zero immediate or delayed reactions. In patients with a clinical history consistent with IgE-mediated penicillin anaphylaxis um, who require penicillins for treatment, it is possible to perform a penicillin desensitization to induce a state of temporary tolerance. The premise is that you administer gradually incremental doses of penicillin, which would subclinically activate mast cells and basophils with the release of tiny amounts of mediators um, that are not sufficient to cause a reaction, but simultaneously activate inhibitory mechanisms that would render these cells non-responsive or hyporesponsive. Thus, the goal is to increase the threshold concentration that would induce a reaction without triggering an anaphylactic reaction. It is only useful in the patients with a history of IgE-mediated reactions and not T-cell-mediated allergy. And these are two examples of different oral as well as parenteral desensitization protocols. Most of the time, we start off with a dose that is one by one, ten, one by ten thousandth of the final target dose, and we use three different concentrations. And the concentration in each successive bag is increased by a factor of ten for parenteral uh, desensitizations. There are standard. 12 to 14 step protocols. And these steps may be increased in number based on the severity of the initial reaction, but we increase the doses every 15 minutes until the target dose is reached. Penicillin allergy labels have received a lot of attention recently, and that is because of the significant um, impact of these labels at both the patient level as well as the population level. At a personal level, the implications would be restricted antibiotics choices, an increased risk of antibiotic-related adverse events, as well as an increased risk of surgical site infections. At a population level, we worried about antibiotic resistance, higher healthcare costs, increased rates of C. diff, and longer hospitalizations. And these have been borne out in several large cohorts of patients across the globe, really. Uh, patients with a penicillin allergy label tend to have a three times higher risk of developing antibiotic-related adverse events. 
um, Blumenthal et al. out of Partners Healthcare found a 50% increased odds of surgical site infections due to concerns about administering cefazolin in patients with uh, perioperative uh, clear, who, who require perioperative clearance and cefazolin use due to concerns about cross-reactivity with penicillins. And in a, a retrospective matched cohort study of more than 500,000 patients out of Kaiser that was published a few years ago, those with a penicillin allergy label had a 23% higher risk of developing C. diff and 30% higher risk of developing VRE. And this was reproduced in a subsequent large cohort out of the United Kingdom. The healthcare costs associated with a penicillin allergy label go beyond just the cost of alternative antibiotics, but also uh, derive from increased side effects as well as toxicities of these alternative antibiotics. If patients with a penicillin allergy label were to develop a surgical site infection, this would result in an additional cost of up to 43,000 US dollars. And if they were to develop a C. diff infection, this would result in an increased um, healthcare cost of almost $11,000. On the other hand, an indirect analysis of cost savings associated with penicillin uh, allergy delabeling suggests that we could save up almost $2,000 per patient per year through penicillin allergy delabeling. So in view of recognition of all of these potential negative downstream consequences of erroneous penicillin allergy labels, several different national organizations have pushed for routine evaluation of all comers with penicillin allergy labels, and the CDC published this fact sheet a few years ago called, Is It Really a Penicillin Allergy? And highlights sort of what we discussed for the last 30 minutes, which is mo most patients who have this penicillin allergy label do not have true reactivity, despite the fact that this is an epidemic with 10% of the US population affected. We often use broad spectrum antibiotics in these patients as alternatives to penicillin that are associated with increased side effects, increased toxicities, and delabeling penicillin allergies would potentially yield um, optimized use of antibiotics and decrease healthcare costs overall. And as a consequence, there have been several programs and service lines set up across the country for penicillin allergy testing and delabeling, and these have been conducted on both the inpatient setting as well as the outpatient setting. Several inpatient programs have been set up, and broadly, these include allergy or infectious disease consults for all, which is a lot of times just not feasible given the magnitude of the problem and the number of board-certified allergists and infectious disease doctors. The implementation of skin test programs, which can be either broadly targeted or based on filters, and the implementation of hybrid programs with decision support guidelines and algorithms. And these are what is increasingly gaining implementation in several different healthcare systems. And the advantages of these inpatient testing programs is that you have ready access, immediate changes in antibiotics, and immediate potential cost savings. And this is one of the first healthcare systems that published their data a couple of years ago out of Parkland in Dallas. Uh, they actually had a dedicated allergy pharmacist who was trained in delabeling penicillin allergy and developed filters within the electronic medical record to identify subjects who would benefit the most from penicillin allergy delabeling based on the prescription of broad spectrum antibiotics, including carbapenems and astreonam. And at the time of publication, more than 700 patients had been tested and 98% of them had been delabeled. Other penicillin allergy pathways have been developed in other healthcare systems to develop a clinical guideline for antibiotic use in patients with penicillin allergy label. And this is one of the seminal um, pathways that has been instituted in uh, Partners Healthcare published several years ago. And this categorizes patients as having a mild reaction history to penicillin. And those patients are clear to receive third and fourth generation cephalosporins and penicillins and first, as well as first and second generation cephalosporins using a graded challenge. On the other hand, patients who are categorized as possibly having a type one hypersensitivity reaction to penicillins are clear to receive third and fourth generation cephalosporins using a graded challenge and require an allergy or infectious disease consult to delabel the rest. Uh, for patients who have a history suggestive of type, four, type two to type four hypersensitivity, the use of all beta-lactams is contraindicated until cleared by a penicillin allergy consult by allergy or infectious disease. Similarly, there have been several outpatient service lines set up now for penicillin allergy testing in several different settings. For instance, in perioperative clinics, Mayo Clinic has incorporated penicillin skin testing as well as challenges into their standard perioperative protocol 
to date, in the past 20 years, they've evaluated more than 30,000 patients, and 99% of them have been delabeled. Um, similar setups have been incorporated into pre-transplant clinics. Some allergists actually have dedicated pencil and allergy testing clinics where they will skin test and challenge like up to six to 10 patients at a time in a half day. Um, our policy at Emory is that we perform routine evaluation of all penicillin allergy labels regarding of the diagnosis that they initially present with. And Blumenthal and all actually published a cost analysis of these outpatient testing methods using this method called a time-driven activity-based cost. And they used several different permutations and combinations and found that if an allergist, say, were to perform a penicillin skin test and then follow it up with a challenge, the cost would be approximately about 225 uh, dollars, but say if a mid-level were to perform the evaluation, skip the skin test, just do a challenge, pa patients with penicillin allergies could be delabeled for less than $100. So now we're back to Mrs. Jones um, with community, a diagnosis of community-acquired pneumonia. Her history of a penicillin allergy was remote, benign during childhood, um, but she probably doesn't require further investigation of a penicillin allergy label in the first place because such patients can safely receive third and fourth generation cephalosporins that do not have R1-based cross-reactivity uh, without any issues, and so she was safely prescribed cefcriaxone. In conclusion, most penicillin allergy labels are erroneous, but they have potential several downstream negative consequences for patients, communities, and healthcare systems, and thus require multidisciplinary service lines on both the inpatient as well as the outpatient levels to tackle the epidemic. Mary Beth's gonna talk about our experience here at Emory. Thanks. So in this last idea of this idea of requiring multidisciplinary effort to tackle this, what I'm gonna talk about is what does that look like in clinical practice? How do we do that? And so what we have done within Emory Healthcare is we first did some background investigation of, is our baseline prescribing impacted by penicillin allergy? The short answer is yes, significantly. And then how good is our allergy documentation? The answer is really terrible. And then what are we doing about it? So we've had a couple of pilot projects. We'll talk briefly about one that's perioperative because I think the safety data there is interesting. And then one that's been done on the hospital medicine services at EUH and at EUHM. And then where we're going from there based on that data. So in terms of our baseline prescribing data, what we found is this is in our anesthesia uh, practice of giving perioperative antibiotics. On the left is what people without a penicillin allergy in the chart got, almost 90% got cefazolin, which is appropriate. And on the right is what people with a penicillin allergy got. And that's a whole panoply of things, including things like clindamycin and levaquin that we would really like to avoid. Within hospital medicine, there's not really a standard measure of this much estrinam or this much mirapenem or this much levaquin is appropriate. But we assume that those are things we would typically like to avoid and that a lot of their use is driven by penicillin allergy. So just looking at a three month period in the last year, we saw on 5G, kind of as a typical hospital medicine floor at EUH, getting more than 40 days of Levaquin per thousand patient days, and similarly getting about four, more than 40 days of Mirapenem per thousand patient days. And on 61 at EUHM, similarly more than 30 days of Levaquin and almost 20 days of Mirapenem. So those are numbers higher than we would like to see. And then we looked at, and this was again in our surgical patients, what's actually documented in these people as the cause of their penicillin allergy? You can see the biggest category here is absolutely nothing. So the chart says they're allergic to penicillin, but you have no idea what that reaction was. And so if they are altered, obtunded, intubated, you are out of luck trying to figure out if this is something really severe or if this was something very benign in childhood. And our next biggest category is anaphylaxis, but as we'll talk about, we've got a lot of people documenting hives, where I think there's a lot of confusion about the difference between hives and rash. Um, we do have a lot of kind of benign rash or itching, and then 7% of the people documented as allergic. The reason for allergy was a side effect. Everything from nauseous to my personal favorites made him moody, and everything looked kind of yellow. <laughs> So in terms of what we did with that data was we decided to try these pilot projects. The first was a perioperative algorithm based on this side chain chart. And so Marin alluded to this, that we think a lot of the cross-reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins 
is actually mediated by that R1 side chain and not by the beta lactam ring. So the question then is just what shares an R1 side chain with what else? And so in the perioperative setting, cefazolin and cefuroxime are our big antibiotic choices. And you can see that column's blank. They do not share an R1 side chain in common with any of the penicillins. And so should theoretically be very safe to use. And so that was the algorithm we implemented was unless they had documentation of organ dysfunction or a scar, one of those severe cutaneous adverse reactions, go ahead and give them cefazolin, even if they anaphylaxed to penicillin. And what we ultimately saw in that algorithm uptake was more than 80% of our perioperative patients with a penicillin allergy now get cefazolin. And that's true with the exception of those severe delayed hypersensitivity reactions, pretty much across the board, including those type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. And so then we looked at the safety data. We had no cases of anaphylaxis in these patients. 0.18% developed a rash, and that resolved on its own despite continuation of the cephalosporin. And then we had another four patients complain of itching, and the majority of these people were on opioids or other medications to which that could have been attributed. So we had nothing serious happen as a result of doing this, even people in penicillin anaphylaxis. So our next question was, okay, what do we do inpatient on hospital medicine where beyond cefazolin and cefuroxime, we may want to use things like ceftriaxone and cefepime? And so we've got good safety data. And similarly, the R1 side chain data, this is all of our IV cephalosporins on formulary in the Emory system. They're all blank too. So ceftriaxone, ceftazidime, cefepime, ceftaroline do not share R1 side chains in common with the penicillins. And so what we were proposing was an algorithm to help guide people in, these are the cephalosporins that are safe to use, and then if you really do need a penicillin, you know, if you've got somebody with neurosyphilis, or if you've got somebody where you need to get good brain penetration, um, there we may be able to do, based on the safety data Marin presented, some of these direct oral challenges. So I'm going to blow this up because this is hard to see, but this was the algorithm we developed to guide the hospital medicine docs through some decision support. So the first was just, what was your reaction? And so the people over on the far left who had organ dysfunction or scars don't give anything in the beta-lactam category. People on the right-hand side where these were side effects, unrelated. My personal favorite, because this is the one that's on my medical record, is family history of penicillin allergy. If you were in those categories, we said any is fine. And really, honestly, you can probably give a penicillin if you need it. It's that middle group that's the most interesting. So this is the group where we want to know how long ago did you have a reaction? Less than a year ago or more than a year ago? If it was pretty recent, we're saying the cephalosporins are probably fine, but if you're going to do a penicillin or one of the cephalosporins that's not listed there, call ID. If it's been more than a year, then we're saying, okay, if you, how long after you took penicillin did you have the reaction? And this is, again, trying to get at that immediate versus delayed reaction idea. And so if this took more than an hour or they have no idea because this was 35 years ago, all of the IV cephalosporins on our formulary are fine. And if you, and these are the people we may do oral challenge in, but we just wanted ID or allergy involvement first. And then on the other side with less than an hour, again, most of the IV cephalosporins are okay. And this is where we may be in the skin testing category for a handful of people who are high risk. And so what we looked at was three months that concluded at the end of June in 2019, and we looked at the same three-month period in the year prior, just in our hospital medicine patients, what happened with our utilization of drugs that we think may be driven by penicillin allergy. And this is what we saw at both EUH and Midtown was statistically significant decreases in prescribing of estreonam, mirapenem, quinolones, and vancomycin. So this looks like this really drives more appropriate prescribing. So our next step is, how do we make this so this is not a sheet of paper people are carrying around with them? How do we incorporate this into the medical record? How do we take this hospital and system-wide? And how do we use it in the outpatient setting? So in terms of the Cerner system, we have submitted a request to IT to look at a couple things. One is to change the allergy history so that it's not free text entry because you get all kinds of things entered that aren't real allergies that should get flagged at that point. And people can also, in our drop-down menu, select the severity of the reaction. 
So we've seen true anaphylaxis noted as a mild reaction, and we've seen headache noted as severe. And I think what they were thinking was the headache was severe, but you're actually saying that was a severe allergy to the drug and it flags in bold or red or all caps in the chart. So we're hoping to tie that drop down menu to a severity to help people out. And then to try to get a pop up where if the patient says they're penicillin allergic, but they got Zosin on their last hospital stay and everything was fine, where it actually would flag that for you. Hey, this person got Piptazo in our system a year ago. You know, look and see if that's the time of the reaction that's documented or if they tolerated it. And then to incorporate those three questions into the EMER as well. So hopefully that is coming. In terms of implementing these algorithms in a wider audience, that perioperative algorithm has also gone live with anesthesia at Grady and is being evaluated to be implemented at the VA. In terms of the inpatient algorithms, at EUH and at Midtown, we're looking at expanding next to the intensive care units because that's where, first of all, you have people who often can't give you any information about their allergy and where we use a lot of our broad spectrum antibiotics. Grady has implemented a similar algorithm and they've actually done something unique where they've got their pharmacists helping to perform penicillin skin testing to decrease the burden on allergy and ID consultation. And then I think the final thing is that opportunities exist in our primary care clinics as well. And so a lot of the same principles are gonna apply in the outpatient setting that you're still looking at that R1 cross reactivity. This is just where you need to be aware that this is a little more complex. So cefuroxime, ceftonir, cefixime, and cefpidoxime in that same category where they don't share an R1 side chain with penicillin. So they, in people who have not had a history of organ dysfunction or a severe reaction, are probably okay. What is a little confusing to those of us who've spent all that time memorizing the cephalosporin generations is that Keflex, Duracef, and Seclor, Cephalexin, Cefadroxil, and Cefaclor all do share R1 side chains with penicillin. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how cefazolin and Keflex have a similar coverage spectrum, just one's IV and one's PO. That does not hold for their allergy risk. Cefazolin has no real risk of cross-reactivity with penicillin, and cephalexin has a fairly significant risk of cross-reactivity. So this is just the thing to be aware of, that those are not transferable between each other. So as we think about how we're going to implement this in the outpatient setting and the decision support we're going to provide, just checking with this kind of reference or talking to somebody with NID and allergy if you've got questions is a really good idea. Because we have seen inpatient people appropriately put somebody on cefazolin for cellulitis who's got a pretty serious penicillin allergy and then convert them to Keflex at discharge. And we're running after them in the hallway like, no, 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 no. Like that, that they may actually react to that. So that's one of the, so the final thing we're gonna have to think about there. All right, and any questions for any of us? Uh, what has the patient response been to this testing? Are patients amenable to being tested or are they hesitant? So for the most part, when we've actually gotten to that part in the algorithm where we do the oral challenge, uh, people have been very receptive. And, you know, especially it, a lot of it rests on the explanation. So usually what we've tried to say is that we need the best drug for you right now is something that is a distant cousin of penicillin. We don't expect that you're going to have a reaction to it. We have a way to check while you're monitoring the hospital and we can keep an eye on you. And once we know that this works, it can really help you get the most targeted antibiotic. And we do talk and we've talked to you with some of the providers and with nursing, because this is a real shift in how people think about this. It makes a lot of people nervous. But we also talk about things like, you know, if people will say, well, you know, we could just give Clinda or we could just give Levaquin. But we've got data that a single dose of Clinda changes your gut flora for four months, that levofloxacin just picked up an additional two black box warnings. So when you talk with people about the risks of the alternatives and the advantages of knowing and you explain how you're going to monitor, and what we do in the inpatient setting is that we have vitals Q15 minutes for the hour after they take the oral challenge, for example, people have been really receptive to that idea. Actually, they're often relieved because they've carried this thing on the chart for so long. And Marin probably does this so much more often in the outpatient setting. 
different in the outpatient setting when patients aren't sick and it's more of an elective delabeling. And what I've seen, and this has also been reproduced in several papers, is that generally there is that level of apprehension and prompting sort of the need to improve our messaging. And there's a lot of concern about how to most delivery uh, effectively deliver this message that penicillin allergy labels are potentially erroneous. Thank you both. We have a question from Midtown. Um, how are patients or public being educated pre-hospitalization or systematically about illegitimate penicillin allergies? So I think so. The, the question was sort of how how do we do this kind of patient education? And there's not a ton done right now, kind of pre-hospital or automatically. But one of the things we really try to talk about is what to do at discharge if somebody did tolerate, if somebody passed an oral challenge in the inpatient setting of amoxicillin. Um, Marin has reported that sometimes if she's actually removed the allergy from the chart after challenging in clinic, the same patient gets referred to her six months later because the next person who asked them, are you, what are you allergic to? They said penicillin. So we've talked about ways to make sure it's in the discharge summary, make sure the discharge summary goes to the PCP, make sure it's, um, what we've actually started doing is, instead of completely deleting the allergy, drawing the line through it and writing in the comments, you know, tolerated amoxicillin, tolerated IV penicillin, tolerated cefazolin, so that those things are there. But I think, again, one of the other challenges, and this is something where we're open to feedback because this is difficult, is if you say, okay, they, they tolerated cefazolin, and you send that out to their all of their community providers, they are likely to make the same assumption that I would have made before talking to Marin that Keflex is then fine when it maybe isn't. So we're trying to think about how to do that communication such that everyone is aware of what is and isn't safe from a decision support perspective, and that's difficult. 